In a small Japanese village on the evening of May 20, 1938, a young man cut the electricity supply to the entire village, leaving all those who lived there in darkness. This would be the beginning of a murderous 90-minute rampage which would result in the deaths of almost half the people who lived there. So what exactly happened this night and why did he do this? My name's Carl. Let's start by getting into the background of the man behind the murders. The subject of today's story is a man called Mutsuo Toi, who was born on the 5th of March, 1917. He came from a middle-class farming family that resided in the town of Kamo in Okayama Prefecture, a place known as the Land of Sunshine. In contrast though, optimism and positivity would not be a prominent feature in Mutsuo's life. When he was only an infant, both his parents died of tuberculosis. This meant Mutsuo and his young sister Monaco would have to move in with their grandmother who would be left with the responsibility of raising two young children. In the early years, Mutsuo was known as a sweet child who had a close relationship with his sister. The two never fought and Mutsuo had enormous respect for his sibling. When he reached his teens, Mutsuo's troubles seemed to be finally behind him. At this time, he was generally known for being outgoing and a model student with great academic ability. But then in 1934, his sister got married. For some reason, this didn't sit well with a now 17-year-old Mutsuo, who started to become hikikomori, a Japanese term for young Japanese people who become extremely socially withdrawn and quiet. Eventually, Mutsuo became old enough to enroll in the Japanese military and decided he wanted to be a soldier. Before starting though, he was required to undergo an inspection, which he did very well in, except for one section, the medical. At the end of the inspection, the army doctor declared that Mutsuo had tuberculosis. At that moment, Mutsuo looked like he was about to cry. He asked, do I really have tuberculosis? The doctor snapped back at him. Do you question an army doctor of the Imperial Japanese Army? There is no doubt you have tuberculosis. Take good care of yourself. How will the soldiers of the Imperial Army be able to work with you? Mutsuo cried with tears spilling out on the floor. During this era of militarism, it was an honour for a boy's family to pass the conscription inspection. Mutsuo's failed attempt was devastating for him. Also, the worry and prejudice from a lot of people in society of tuberculosis was deep. The shame of this, combined with the fact that both his parents died from the same illness and that it was considered to be a death sentence, must have been very confronting and extremely overwhelming for young Mutsuo. In 1936, the famous murderer, Seda Abe, who cruelly murdered her partner, released her testimony. A now reclusive Mutsuo became fascinated by her story and it had a heavy influence on him. He told an acquaintance at the time, I'm going to die from lung disease anyway, so I'll do something more terrifying than Seda Abe. During this time, there was a Japanese activity called Yobe or night crawling. It was practiced by unmarried Japanese men and women. A man would secretly crawl in a woman's room at night and make his intentions known. If a woman consented, they would sleep together. This is something that Mutsuo participated in frequently. He managed to get involved in a few flings, but eventually became frustrated and despondent over rejections from many women. He blamed his tuberculosis diagnosis and became extremely bitter. Mutsuo's neighbours and fellow villagers grew suspicious of him. Some started to become worried about his behaviour. This would put further distance between Mutsuo and the rest of society. At some stage, it became too much. Mutsuo began plotting and scheming a way to get back at society. He would write, The target day is approaching and I will take revenge. Not long after, in the rural village of Kamo on a rainy cool evening of May 20, 1938, a 21-year-old Mutsuo climbed an electricity pole and cut off the transmission. The entire village was now without power and completely dark. The people who lived there were now vulnerable and ripe for the picking. But firstly, Mutsuo returned home to his grandmother's to get prepared. He made his way up to the attic and put on some military-style clothing. 
He attached two small flashlights to a headband and wrapped it around his head, then hung a bicycle lamp from his neck with a string. He put one Japanese sword and two knives on his left hip. In his hand, he held onto a Browning hunting gun and put 100 live ammunitions in his pocket. He also hung an ammunition sack from his left shoulder which contained another 100 ammunitions. By now it was around 1.40am. Mutsuo was ready to commence, so he proceeded to step down from the attic. Downstairs, his 76-year-old grandmother was laying down sound asleep. Mutsuo walked over towards her, grabbed an axe and took a swing at his grandmother's neck and decapitated her, the woman who raised him. This was just the beginning. Next door lived the Kishimoto's, a family of five. The mother of the household, 50-year-old Suyiko, was someone who Mutsuo had previously had an intimate relationship with. However, she had recently rejected him, but he didn't hear it directly from her. He was informed by the village. Due to the times, the location, and because of previous crawling efforts, Mutsuo knew the house was unlocked and so he easily gained entry into the home and snuck in quietly. In the darkness, Mutsuo slowly approached Suiko's half-naked body while she was sleeping, then slowly pulled out his sword and stabbed her in the neck and chest. Her two young sons, 14-year-old Yoshio and younger brother Mamoru, who was only 11, were sleeping beside her. They too were brutally slashed with a sword and died there with their mother. With the kill count at four, Mutsuo quickly moved on to the next target, the home of Hideji Nishida. Here lived four people. Mutsuo had many intimate encounters with Hideji's wife, 43-year-old Tom. Only a few days previous to this, Tom's friends thought it was dangerous to be home and invited her to leave the village, but she refused, saying, oh, I'm not hated enough to be killed. Once again, the house was unlocked. When Mutsuo stepped inside and made his way over to Tome, he pointed his hunting gun towards her abdomen and fired a shot. Tome's internal organs seeped out and she died there instantly. In the next room, three people were snugly sleeping on a katatsu. They included the oldest daughter, 22-year-old Yoshiko, her 50-year-old husband, Shuji, and Tome's 22-year-old sister, Shizuru. Mutsuo previously had relations with Yoshiko, but she married into another family. Mutsuo specifically chose this day for the killing spree because he knew she would be home. The loud bang from the gunshot must have woken them. When Mutsuo entered the room, they jumped up in a panic and in rapid succession, each of them was shot from close range with a hunting gun. They all died with large bullet holes left in their bodies. The fourth house was the home of to Katsukasa Kishimoto, a family of four. Again, the doors were unlocked, and so Mutsuo easily entered by the front door. 22-year-old Takatsukasa and his six-month pregnant 20-year-old wife Tumo were inside sleeping on a single futon. Mutsuo approached very timidly, then raised his gun and shot them dead where they were. Almost out of nowhere, 18-year-old nephew Takio boldly jumped in, in a brave attempt to intervene. But Mutsuo beat him down, cracking the young man's lower jaw. Mutsuo then took the opportunity and shot Takio in the chest with the hunting gun, killing him. The mother of the house, 70-year-old Tama, was crouching and trembling after what just unfolded to her family. She fell down in agony at Mutsuo's feet and pleaded with him. Mutsuo then responded scoldingly, Old woman, raise your head. He then pushed her head up with the muzzle and then fired at her chest. Mutsuo departed the house. All alone, Tama rolled around and writhed in pain for some time, but managed to survive despite the close-range gunshot, one of the very few silver linings on this night of devastation. With the number of deceased at 11, Mutsuo moved on to the house of 60-year-old Siichi Terakawa. Inside was a family of six, who were all awake because they had heard the gunshots in the distance. But yet again, the door was unlocked. Mutsuo turned the door handle and on entry, his first encounter was with Siichi. Mutsuo didn't waste any time. He aimed up and shot the man dead in his own house. The eldest son, 19-year-old Sadaichi, frantically tried to flee. He bolted quickly towards a window, but was shot dead a moment before he could escape. His two sisters, 15-year-old Toki and 12-year-old Hana, headed towards an exit. 
But when they tried to open the shutter to the corridor, they were swiftly intercepted by Mutsuo and fatally gunned down. Continuing on his rampage, Mutsuo marched down the corridor and encountered the 22-year-old wife of Sadaichi named Setsuko. The couple were newlyweds who were just married only six days previous. In the house, Setsuko was cornered in the corridor with nowhere to run. Mutsuo aimed up and shot her in the chest, killing her. Next, he came face to face with another one of his former interests, 22-year-old Yuriko. The two were once in a relationship, but Yuriko decided to marry another man. Allegedly one night, Mutsuo crawled into the couple's room and tried to get her back, but was rejected. Mutsuo didn't forget this. Back to the house, Yuriko escaped promptly from the back door and slipped out to a nearby neighbor's house. Her movements didn't go unnoticed by Mutsuo, who followed her close behind. The house that Yuriko fled to was owned by 45-year-old Shigekichi Terakawa, who was not actually part of the original plan of Mutsuo's aggression, but this story would still end in tragedy. At home was a family of five. Immediately after Yuriko closed the front door behind her, Mutsuo stormed down towards her and yelled, Open it! If you don't open it, I'll shoot! When Shigekichi's father, 86-year-old Kishiro, curiously opened the shutter to have a look, Mutsuo fired his hunting gun directly at him, killing him immediately. Kishiro fell to the ground with two 5-6cm to six centimeter holes in his chest. Yuriko and the rest of the family in a frantic panic closed all the doors and waited nervously. Mutsuo fired his gun from the outside and started banging on the back door repeatedly and violently. Shigekichi felt that they would all be killed, his whole family, if they stayed there, and so he tasked his son, 17-year-old Shinji, to quickly get out of there and notify one of the neighbours to go and get help. A very bold plan. But he did what was asked for him, for the sake of the family. Shinji bravely jumped out of the house's side entrance and ran into a bamboo grove out the back. Mutsuo noticed this though, and immediately charged off in pursuit of young Shinji. A frantic and panicked Shinji quickly realised he was being chased and so he laid down in the thick of the dense bamboo leaves and nervously held his breath and waited. Mutsuo started yelling threats, but Shinji didn't move. His life depended on it. Inside the house, the frightened family were crying and in tears. They believed that Mutsuo had killed Shinji. Yuriko, whose arrival brought Mutsuo into the house and put the Terakawa family in danger, was sobbing apologetically. She cried, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please bear with me. Shigekichi quietly approached the back to try and sneak a look through a gap in the door. What he saw was Mutsuo standing there, right next to the door, and also that Shinji wasn't there. Mutsuo shouted, If you can't open it, I'll bring an axe and break it. Mutsuo then proceeded to ram the door with his gun stocks and fired two shots through it. One of the bullets hit Shigekichi's daughter, 21-year-old Yukiko, in the thigh, but her injuries would not be fatal. By this time, finally, some of the other villagers began to take notice of the gunshots and screams that had been echoing throughout the town in the early hours. Meanwhile, Mutsuo left the Terakawas and moved on to the next. This particular house was situated on a hill and belonged to Yoshini Terakawa, who was 21 years old, and he lived there with his widow's mother, 45-year-old Toyo. The details are vague, but apparently Mutsuo had some type of relationship with Toyo. Mutsuo didn't take much time. He shot them both while they were asleep by pressing the muzzle of his gun through the top of a futon. These two would be Mutsuo's 18th and 19th victims of the night but he still wasn't done. He moved on to the house of 85-year-old Shikichi Terakawa, which was situated just south of Mutsuo's own house, where his dead grandmother's body still lay. A total of eight people lived in this residence. Six were family members and two were silk workers. Apparently, Mutsuo was once refused by one of Shikichi's daughters. Mutsuo managed to sneak into the house. He made his way into the silk room where people were sleeping. He fired a couple of shots. One of the workers was shot in the head and died there. The other was shot in the lower intestines and died there also. 65-year-old sister-in-law Harachi was approached next. Harachi begged Mutsuo. She pleaded, Please bear with me. Please hold back. Mutsuo, undeterred by her plea, fired two bullets, hitting her in the abdomen, killing her quickly. 
Mutsuo hopped out of the silk room and opened the shutter on the veranda. His lights caught Shikichi sitting on a katatsu. Shikichi looked up but didn't display any reaction or emotion. Mutsuo said to him, I'll shoot even if you're old. I've killed a grandfather. I won't hesitate. Shikichi grinned. Mutsuo didn't realize that Shikichi's brother, 64-year-old Asaichi, was sleeping nearby and nervously trembled whilst pretending to sleep. Mutsuo pointed his lights in Asaichi's direction. Mutsuo noticed him there and kicked the pillow. A stunned Asaichi tried to get up, but Mutsuo pushed him back down with the muzzle of his gun and said, I will shoot if anyone moves. Be quiet. Please help me, Asaichi desperately pleaded. Mutsuo asked him, perhaps daringly, to make fun of him, but he remained silent. Isn't he so sad about his life, Mutsuo joked. Asaichi nodded his head like a child repeatedly with his hands nervously clapped together. Mutsuo looked at him and said, Okay, I'll help you. Mutsuo then walked away and departed the house, a rare display of restraint. The remaining survivors who were hiding under the floor beds were relieved when they realized he had finally left. The next house was the residence of 47-year-old Ito Tange and her two children. One of them was Suruyo, who was just gunned down at Shikichi's house moments prior. The other was 28-year-old Yuchi, who was once married to Yuriko Terakawa, likely the reason for Mutsuo's arrival. When Mutsuo stepped foot on the property, Ito was watching wood burn in the fireplace. Mutsuo approached her and said, Your daughter has already been killed. This time, you will be. He then fired at her and quickly left the house. Ito's screams and the sound of the gunshot woke up her son Yuchi, who was sleeping in the main room. Ito was seriously injured and later was taken away to Sagano Hospital, but six hours later, she succumbed to her injuries and died. Yuchi raced out of the house and went to Nishikamo police station box, but there was no policeman on duty. So he ran and ran about three kilometers down the road, found a bicycle and arrived 20 minutes later at 2.40 a.m. to the Kamo Cho police box and found the officer on duty lying on a bed. The officer was Constable Imada who jumped up at the sound of Yuchi's cry for help. Yuchi yelled through the window, Mister, get up, it's a murderer. The constable could see his jaw moving. Before listening to his story, Imada asked, Did Mutsuo do this? I was always worried about the movements of Mutsuo. Imara had responded to many concerns from villagers in days previous, worried about Mutsuo's behaviour. Imara immediately reported the incident to the assistant police officer and the police at a neighbouring village. He requested the fire brigade, asked his wife to organise a doctor and beat the bells of the surrounding villages to alert everyone of the unfolding situation. Meanwhile, Mutsuo had already intruded into his 10th house, which was the home of 37-year-old Suyo Ekiyama. Living here was a family of eight, with the exception of elder son Hiroshi, who was away on a school trip. Mutsuo added this house to his targets because Suyo was the older brother of Matsuko Terakawa. Mutsuo was once interested in Matsuko, but she suddenly changed her mind when she learned that he had tuberculosis. The family's youngest son noticed Mutsuo and, quickly understanding the danger of the situation, promptly escaped out of the house. Mutsuo quickly found him outside and took aim at him, but the bullets missed, allowing the boy to rush into the bamboo bush and escape. Mutsuo decided not to pursue him, but instead turned his attention to the house and blasted a shot at Suyo's 34-year-old wife Maya with a hunting gun, killing her. He then moved along quickly and noticed their son, Akio, a young boy who was only five years old. Mutsuo pulled the trigger and shot Akio, killing him instantly, his body so badly mutilated by bullet wounds that his organs protruded. His 72-year-old grandmother, Suru, was next. Mutsuo fired at her. The bullet landed in her right shoulder and she died there from heavy bleeding. Her husband, 74-year-old Kitsichi, desperately attempted to escape out the front, but Mutsuo blasted a shot at him before he could make it. Kitsichi was shot six times all over his body, exposing his lungs, and he died there also. While all this was happening, his other young grandsons, 12-year-old Akira and 9-year-old Shozo, managed to escape without getting hit by any bullets. 
Next was the home of 61-year-old Kurichi Terakawa, the wealthiest person in the village. He lived on the hill with a family of three. When Mutsuo was ascending towards the house, climbing the slope, the lamp hanging around his chest went out, but he continued to press on. As he approached the house, he started running towards the front gate yelling Kurichi's name. Kurichi's wife, 56-year-old Hama, curious about the noise, with a candle in one hand, approached one of the shutters and scanned around to see if anyone was outside. When she noticed someone approaching, she turned to Yu, her 28-year-old son. Then that second, a bullet exploded through the window, hitting her in the right shoulder that was supporting the candle. But she gritted through the pain and quickly closed the shutter. The three of them desperately scrambled to prevent an invasion and blocked off all the windows and doors as quickly as they could. Mutsuo fired five shots through the closed shutters. This time, one of the bullets went through Hama's right arm, injuring her substantially. After a while, Kurichi stopped holding the shutters, ran upstairs, opened up a window and screamed out over and over, Help me! Help me! Murder! Someone come! It was said that his voice reached all the villages due to the house being on the hill. Mutsuo aimed another shot at Kurichi, but the bullets only hit the roof tiles. Kurichi nervously lay down on the floor and kept low. Mutsuo gave up and left them. Hama was taken to Sagano Hospital, but sadly died 12 hours later due to heavy blood loss. To this point, the spree had taken place entirely in Kamo village, but the next house, the residence of 51-year-old Kazuo Abe, was in Sakamoto village, which is northwest of Kamo. Mutsuo made it here by running up a hillside road of about 2 kilometers. Kazuo lived there with his wife, 32-year-old Mayo. Mutsuo had been involved with her many times, but Kazuo had been trying hard to prevent anything from happening. Recently, Mayo had become cold towards Mutsuo. Kazuo had become suspicious of Mutsuo's night crawling and had recently bought an air gun to repel him, but still, like many others on this night, failed to lock the front door. Mutsuo gained easy entry, but for the first time tonight, he was in danger. Kazuo bravely grabbed his air gun and attempted to fight back against the threat of Mutsuo, but it wasn't enough. Mutsuo shot him seven times, murdering him with his hunting gun, then walked over and shot and killed Mayo. So in only 90 minutes, Mutsuo had murdered 30 people, one seriously injured and two with minor injuries, but he still had one job remaining. At around 3am after leaving the house, Mutsuo appeared at the home of 66-year-old Masuchi Takeda. He called out, Good evening, good evening and went into the room where Matsuji and the others were sleeping. When Matsuji saw Mutsuo, he thought it was a robbery. Mutsuo said, Old man, don't tremble. Please hurry up. I need paper and a pencil. A police car is chasing me down here. While Matsuji was looking for the paper, Mutsuo said to Matsuji's grandson Achen, who was sleeping in the room, Achen, you're here, right? Your grandfather will not find the paper and pencil in time, so give me a pencil and a notebook. When Achan pulled out a pencil and notebook, Mutsuo tore off a part of the notebook and said, I won't shoot innocent people, don't worry. Then he said, Study hard and become a great man. Mutsuo then hurried out. Mitsuji suspected that Mutsuo requested paper and pencil with the intention of writing a suicide note, but the grandson didn't understand the meaning. Mutsuo ascended towards the summit of Mount Senjo, then 3.5 kilometers into the mountain, he pointed his hunting gun at his own torso. He pulled the trigger and shot himself. His estimated time of death was around 5 a.m., around when the sun was beginning to rise. Mutsuo's corpse was found there with a flashlight, headband, sword, two aikuchi, a bicycle lamp and a sack all lined up beside him. A suicide note was left behind by Mutsuo. It read, As I am about to die, I would like to write a note. Oh, I'm sorry for my grandmother. I'm truly sorry. My grandmother, who raised me since I was two years old. I shouldn't have killed my grandmother, but I did what I did because of the pity she would be left with behind. I wanted to make my grandmother's death easier, but I did such a miserable thing. I'm truly sorry. Tears, tears. I keep shedding tears of apology. I'm sorry for my older sister too. I'm very sorry. Please forgive me. I was a boring brother. 
for doing this, even if it's out of resentment. There's no need to make a grave for me, or I would be happy to rot and die in the field. During the four years that I was ill, I really wept at the harshness and oppression of society. Although my relatives told me they loved me a little, I cried for how little it was. Society should also have a little sympathy for those who have no one to care for them, the tuberculosis patients. In fact, I've had enough of being a weak one. In the next life, I'll be born as a strong person. In fact, I had an unhappy life. In the next life, I'll be born happy. Everything didn't go as I expected. The reason why I decided to do it today was because Yuriko Terakawa, who I used to have a relationship with, came to Kamo. It was also because Yoshiko Nishida came too, but I missed the chance to kill Yuriko Terakawa. Also, the guy named Soichi Terakawa, it's pathetic that I actually let him live. A person like that should be buried from this world. Because he has money, he targets widows, and there is hardly anyone in Kamo who has not had a relationship with him. Dawn is almost here. Let me die. Sometime after, Mutsuo's sister Monaco, who he cared for deeply, died of tuberculosis, something which made it through the entire family. A Japanese movie was released in the 1980s, loosely based on Mutsuo's killing spree. Thank you for watching. This case remains Japan's deadliest shooting by a lone gunman, which was largely forgotten about because of the outbreak of World War II. Anyway, that's all I have today. If you would like to watch more videos about true crime stories from the past, please consider subscribing. I would appreciate it. See you next time. Thanks again.